Canada before we even start to welcome him and introduce Vince to new audience in America, the rest of the world, and in Singapore. A little bit about Singapore to Vince and to your followers. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, we're talking about uh, Joseph Prince. He does a great job for promoting Singapore. Um, and and of course, he hates the largest church in Singapore. But really, Singapore is a place whereby we accept all people, all works of life. Um, you're poor, you have no money, you're rich, a lot of money. You have an arm, you don't have an arm. Um, you speak Chinese, you don't speak Chinese, you speak English, you don't speak English. I mean, who cares? Um, as long as you're a good human being, that's all we care about. Um, and whatever faith we accept you, um, uh, you know, I've got friends with Muslims, my best friends are Muslims, my best friends are Hindus, uh, my sister is Buddhist, my father is cremated in a Buddhist temple, his ashes uh, are in a Buddhist temple. Um, my mom accepted Christ uh, two years before she um, went home to the Lord. Um, my brother accepted Christ and myself, I'm the first family, I'm the first family member who actually accepted Christ. So we have within ourselves a microcosm within the family of different faith. And I think there's a lot of love and respect for that because I think um, there are so many facets to a human being. We don't want to like um, say, hey, you are defined by your color. You are defined by your clothes. You are defined by the brand. You know, okay, you're defined by the car that you drive. I mean, I would love to, but I, I think um, I think that makes things really superficial in a very dynamic world and very dynamic, uh, complex human being. But I think um, being Singapore and, and living in Singapore, I think we like to talk about commonalities. We like to talk about um, uh, accepting differences. We like to talk about um, living uh, harmoniously um, in a small space uh, where we can really say that this is a place where we work, we make money and pay our bills, um, and we strive towards a dream and make our, our, our walk on earth uh, meaningful. And, and I think that kind of formula um, transcends whatever background you're from. So, so I mean, to Vince and to all the listeners and your followers, um, this is a place I call home. I am a Singaporean, and I love this place. I love to welcome Vince to Singapore. Yay! Thank you. So, Vince, tell us about you. Where you come from? Uh, thanks, uh, Vicky. I was born in Miami, Florida. And I spent pretty much 40 years in Florida growing up. And uh, I'm now currently in Atlanta, Georgia. And I would just say that uh, I, I operate now as a coach. I help people optimize performance in various areas of their lives. I help people overcome trauma, emotional and mental conflict, yeah. relationship conflict. Uh, I work with parents and teens. Yeah. Um, I love helping people really do what I call inner coaching. Yeah, and inner that coaching. is... Yeah, work within, uh, deal with the mental, emotional conditions that are subconsciously controlling their behavior, wow. causing problems and damaging effects in their lives, sabotaging effects in their lives and their relationships. And uh, I'm really effective at what I do. I've got over 20 something years of experience uh, pursuing an understanding of the inner world of human beings, starting with myself. Uh, in 1999, I nearly died uh, from a drug overdose, um, not the first drug overdose, but a, a more severe drug overdose where my heart stopped beating for a few minutes. And uh, this time I took it seriously. And I realized that unless I changed my life quickly, I was probably going to be dead pretty soon. I was using drugs like cocaine and ecstasy and LSD and pills and drinking alcohol the whole time, and smoking weed the whole time for about two to four days straight with no sleep every time I got started. And I could do that a few times a month. And it was starting to take a toll on my, my mind, my body. Um, my life was certainly directly impacted. And uh, I finally just got real with myself and said, this can't continue. I got to make a change. And uh, once I began to pursue that change in my life, I had to really take inventory about everything in my life, who I was hanging out with, who I was being, what I was thinking, what I was committed to, and I just gave it all up. I gave up all the relationships I have, literally every single relationship 
was just null at that point. I wouldn't hang out with anybody anymore. I, I became what I call like a zero. I didn't know yeah. who I was, where yeah. I belonged, what I would be. It was very difficult to go from one extreme to the next, yeah. but I knew it was the necessary radical shift that I needed to make. Um, and by zeroing out my identity, it was hard to have like no identity, not know who I am. I'm 20, almost 22 years old and realizing that I've spent years of my life building this character that I no longer can use. And I, but I didn't know what else to be. I had no other example, no model. And I just spent a lot of time in nature. I began practicing Zen Buddhist meditation very intensely. And uh, that, that was very helpful for me. I started to get calm and quiet. I sobered up. But what I didn't realize was about to happen through the meditation was that I was going to start to get more internally aware of what I had been suppressing with the life of crime and drugs and alcohol. And what started to surface was memories of my uh, stepfather at the time who, who was abusive to my mother starting at around the age of 10, like very violently physically abusive. And those memories and those feelings began to surface. And I started to have a lot of emotional breakdowns as some people might call it, but I look at it as more like emotional breakthroughs. They were really um, scary looking for me at first. And for someone looking uh, in from the outside, they probably would have thought I was in a really bad place. But what was happening is I was really beginning to embrace the pain that I had suppressed and was actually repressed now after all these years. And it, it actually, even though it looked ugly, there was a lot of tears and anger and rage and all kinds of crazy emotion. I didn't have the tools that I have today to manage these different conditions internally that people deal with, but I somehow was able to move through it. Not perfectly. I almost committed suicide in the midst of encountering some of these things because it was so painful and tragic what was coming up in my view and how I viewed myself, how I viewed the world, what I thought about my past and mm. the choices I made. And, you know, I really just fortunately survived all of that and got a tremendous amount of relief. Mm. And I began to experience an amazing amount of peace. And, and then I had a profound spiritual awakening that was like the climax. Uh, I wasn't going to church. I wasn't into religious mm. groups of, of any kind. The Zen Buddhist practice was not like, I wouldn't consider that a religion. It was just a practice of mindfulness and being present yeah. and Be aware. Present. Yes. And, and it led to this day where I just had a huge inversion of my awareness not only my attention is out here in the world and or in my mind or in my emotions but it went penetrating even to a deeper level and I just became a witness of all of this light it was just amazing illumination that was in me and I fell to my knees I found myself saying the words Jesus Christ which I thought was wild because I had no affinity to Jesus whatsoever and but I had this instant knowing that my nature, God's nature is perfect love and wholeness and that immortality was my essence. And not only mine, but that all humanity actually comes from the space from which I was now experiencing myself in or as. And I didn't have language to describe it back then. I just was like, I just knew that we all come from or exist in and through with this thing we call God, but it was just a profound realization and I became extremely passionate about understanding what the heck that just was and how in the world could I help other people realize the truth of who they are. And so I've spent a lot of time in different religions. I've studied most of the world's great religions, spent a lot of time in Christianity. I'm an avid student of the Bible. And I've come to realize that what I experienced transcends belief systems altogether. What I experienced was a direct experience. It was a revelation of what mm. is and what was and what always will be. And I believe the Bible and other religious texts and leaders have pointed to this particular experience that I had because I've read many of them now and I understand their words only because of my experience. I can only realize their language points to what I experienced because of the experience I've had. Um, but I do see today that religions are still an effort to propagate ideas and concepts. They're still living in an intellectual typically linguistic limited um, domain. And so I'm, I'm, I, I like to live beyond that and serve beyond that. I'm not interested in what you believe. I don't believe you have to accept the particular language of a religion or anything like that. I just, I've worked very hard to develop ways and means to lead people to a direct encounter 
of the truth that they already are. So what I realized in that moment, 22 years ago now almost was that everybody is the very essence of life itself already. But what's in the way is the mental and emotional conditioning that fixes their attention upon the memory, present circumstances, their fears of the future, their anticipation of whatever, whatever idolized structures they're attached to. Um, it's like a habit of focus and attention. So what I do through my inner coaching work is I help people unhook from their idols, their attachments, their belief systems to actually know directly by experience all those belief systems that they were believing, they actually have a realized experience of it. So it's, I'm not interested in giving people religious experience or a set of beliefs or anything. I'm interested in people knowing who they are, having self-realization and getting freed from the mental and emotional pain and suffering they've been living in. Yeah, um, that's a lot to um, pack in, Vince, and you have said that very eloquently. And in many points, I do absolutely agree. And they are really deep. So I, I like to bring our, our conversation to a descriptive uh, uh, level, um, personal level. Um, tell us, before you come to this level of realization of this um, inner work that you have done, Tell us a couple, maybe two instances, uh, describe two instances um, of that level of deprivation you were in. And then, you know, that decision, you say, okay, let's cut everything away. What triggered that? Because you say that, oh, you realize something must have triggered that. Tell us about yeah. um, the, the two, probably just two descriptive uh, instances so that I am myself and probably the audience and the listen, listeners can relate to even more to say that, hey, I think I went through that or I think someone must have gone through that. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, um, I don't know how many people may have gone through something like this, but a, yeah. a, a, big, a big low and also an interesting part of the yeah. turning point for me was in 1998, June yeah. of 1998, I believe I was arrested yeah. And uh, I received two felonies for possession and intent to distribute cocaine and marijuana. Yeah. Yeah. And that arrest was unexpected, mm. uh, but relieving. I was uh, hanging out with some girls. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the girls had connected with someone who was interested in buying some cocaine. Oh. I was going to the apartment, uh, got there. There was something strange about the apartment. There was not much furniture. The guys that were in there, they seemed strange to me. Yeah. They wanted to buy some cocaine. Yeah. I didn't sell to them anything because something fell off to me. Yeah. Uh, looking back, I feel that I was obviously being set up um, mm. somehow, some way. And yeah. uh, then as I was pulling out of that neighborhood, uh, I saw the flashing lights mm. uh, behind yeah. me guy knocks on my window when he came up, comes up to the mm -hmm. car. Uh, I had been partying for two days. I had these three girls with me. We're all doing cocaine uh, nonstop for two days straight. Uh, mm. I had tons of cocaine on me and uh, marijuana. I had weapons. I had money. Mm. I had drug stash in my car. I, I mean, it was just, I had almost everything. I was in the process of moving. So I had so much with me and I should never have been riding around with that if I was smart. Um, mm. But he knocked on the, the window. He asked to see my driver's license registration. I said, no problem. And then he just said, you know what? Just get the F out the car. And I was mm. like, oh man, something's going on here. And I had been drinking too for days. I had a bottle of Jack Daniels right there in the car. And like, so I get out of the car and I see like about 12 different uh, sheriff's vehicles, undercover yeah. cops, and all these cops start approaching me. And I knew something was going down. Yeah. When they put the handcuffs on me, I remember feeling a huge sense of relief. Really? I just, my shoulders were like up. And like, I remember when the handcuffs were on me and I just like, I felt this relaxation that I had not known. I had been living under so much stress. And yeah. it was like, at that moment, I became aware of how the life I was living wasn't working for me. It's very stressful to live a life. I wasn't just dealing drugs. I was counterfeiting doing credit card fraud. I mean, I was in all kinds of stuff illegal. And, and, and at what age were you, um, Vince, at that time? In 98, I was 20 years old. Okay, so you were actually led by the wrong company or that you led the wrong company. <laughs> I like to say that. I mean, a lot of... <laughs> yeah, I built the wrong business, basically. 
<laughs> we would like to say that you were led, but I think you led. <laughs> but you know, I'm glad that. Um, so that was, it was like an instance. Um, but you know, jokes aside, laughter aside, um, I'm glad that you are the gentleman that you are now. That you are reaching out to people um, um, in a big way, uh, in your way, uh, reaching out to internationally um, through the means that you've got. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people are struggling. They may not be struggling like drugs, right? They have their idols in their lives, right? Um, yes. The money, um, the career, the pride, um, the hatred that they, 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 they hold on to. I mean, these are the idols that we don't let go. Uh, tell us what was that intervention thing that um, made you realize, you know, you had a physical intervention because you had this shackles, uh, uh, you know, handcuffs and all this, but was there a illuminating mental um, kind of realization that, hey, I really need to do that. So you did, you did say there was a point, but what was that triggered and that, did, could you describe that process? Yeah, so there was what a day process. What was it? Was it a day? Was it a night? Tell us about that it was. It was like evening, but there was a process leading up to that. I told you about the Zen Buddhist meditation practice. Oh. Uh, I also, I was reading a lot. I went to the library in search of answers, in search of the meaning of life. I was terrified that I had nearly died in that mm. overdose. And mm. I didn't have an experience like mm. some people have out of body, you know, yeah. near death experiences of God or angels or heaven or even hell. Mm. Like there was yeah. nothing for me. So that just reflecting, I was in the hospital. I violated probation with that drug overdose. I was yeah. on probation at the time and using drugs was sure. a violation. Wow. So because I overdosed, they had locked me up, they handcuffed me to the mm. bed and I'm just sitting there and I'm like seeing this and I'm like thinking like, man, like if I didn't wake up, Mm. if I didn't come back to life, what would have yeah. happened to me? Like, yes. where would I be? Where, what was, you know, and mm. that there was no answer there. Mm. And that there was like a fear of mm. like, like a terror, even like, Oh my God, I could have died and not mm. even known that I had died. Mm. And that made me feel so powerless and so out of control mm. and so eager to try and mm. find out if there was more to life and mm. if there was even something like life after death. Mm. And I wanted to know what the truth was. And I knew religions existed, but I wasn't willing to accept anyone else's beliefs mm. or ideas. I'm like, mm. I need to know for myself. I don't care what anybody says. Mm. I need to know and see and experience the reality. If God is real, I need to know that God is real. I don't, I don't live, I couldn't live in my head about it. I knew something I knew, like my mind is not going to be the place to know reality. I need to know it as a direct encounter with my whole being. So I became eager for that. And so that was a daily intense demand of my soul. I was like, I want to know if God's real. I want to know if there's life after death. I want to know what the meaning and purposes of life. Yeah. I demand to have the truth. I demand to have knowledge of the absolute. Like these were things I just began to be a demand for as an emotional like intentional condition of being. And so how, that, how long was that whole process? Um, that phase, I should say. That went on for months. I would yeah. say months, less than a year. And then I had that profound awakening, which mm -hmm. I believe was the result of my intense drive to know. Because after, after work, it was like I was meditating. I was contemplating, trying to figure out, questioning what the universe was about. How, why is the star the way the star is and the moon and the plants. And I was like trying to look into everything with all my intensity to figure it all out. And mm -hmm. I think that just that sincere, intense passion resulted in the opening. So that was when you were 20 years old, right? Because you, you say that you were so involved in the drugs and all this. So, so you about were like- 22 when I had the awakening, yeah. Okay, so eventually when you came to, you were actually 22. Yeah. Okay. About 22, I think. Yeah, I don't yeah, remember the I mean, exact how, month. How did that, I mean, for everyone, it's so different. Yeah. Um, for, for myself, it took the pandemic. <laughs> you know, um, an external intervention. But, you know, how did that um, came upon you that, hey, I think I got that. I think I got that. I got meaning. that. Like, you know, yeah, I, can't, I find out I found that meaning. I found that gold. You know, like I've 
Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean, <clears throat> it's hard to put into words because it was literally, I just simply was remembering mm. what I already am mm. and already was. Mm. Like, it wasn't like I became something I wasn't. It was yeah. a realization that, oh, this is where I come from. Yeah. And that self-realization that I am one with God and one with everything. Mm. There's no separation. Mm. There's no God in Vince. Mm. There's just God. Mm. There's just the totality of life itself. And everything and everyone exists in and as that thing, which we call God. It was just an immediate knowing, right? There was the first, like, the words Jesus Christ came off my mouth, but I didn't see a man separate from me. It was the knowing that Jesus mm. Christ looking back now and studying the Bible and doing all these things, I realized that Jesus Christ is the revelation of the pattern of our true existence. So you, 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 do you consider yourself a Christ follower or just someone who is spiritually um, inclined at this moment or at that moment at, the, at different phases? Well, all right. So when someone asked me, do I consider myself a Christ follower? The words Christ follower if I really want to look at those words, yeah. they mean something to people and they mm. mean different things to different people. Mm. One person's version of following Christ means they need to go do missionary work or they need to knock on doors. They need to convince people to accept Jesus or they go to hell. So I don't identify with Christianity in that mass. Okay. No, um, I, I love the church in all churches. I don't care what they believe. I can mm. be with them. I just believe that my experience transcends what the average Christian knows, even mm -hmm. the average preacher, even great preachers. I think that my direct experience transcends what they understand or have had as a rev like, I don't believe that they've had the revelation. Mm -hmm. I believe that they're propagating information. And I don't think it's the same thing. I think they're, mm -hmm. they're passed on a tradition, but they don't have a direct realization of the significance of what the scriptures are pointing to. Because when you start to look at the Hebrew and the Greek, and you really mm. break the words open, there's some profound things that the authors like Paul speak mm. to or Peter or John. And mm. there's strange language that they use, but that language is familiar for me because I feel like when, when Paul says, you know, before the foundation of the world in Ephesians chapter one, God chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless. Mm. See, I got that as an experience. I didn't get that from the Bible. I had the experience that I existed with God before the foundation of the world. So when I read Paul, I'm like, he knows what I'm talking about. Like that guy has been there. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like I have a partner in revelation. And I don't think a lot of Christians really understand the significance of a lot of the words of the Bible. And the reason I say that is because I spend a lot of time with them. I, I talk with them. I hear them teaching. I hear them preaching. And I can tell that they don't actually know or have experienced the fullness of what the scripture is pointing to because mm -hmm. the language will change their mm -hmm. language betrays them in a sense the mm -hmm. language reveals that they don't have a revelation they're just propagating or duplicating information they've received from someone else i didn't get my insights from a preacher i mm -hmm. got my insights from a direct encounter within my own being and i believe all the prophets and all the teachers of scripture that wrote anything of significance also were speaking from the place of revelation mm -hmm. and they say so and there's a, that word revelation is, is a powerful word. It means to have been witness to what already is. It was already there, but there was something in the way and mm -hmm. now is revealed. So I see that Jesus is the pattern of everyone's life. There's just those of us who know it and then mm -hmm. those of us who don't. And then there's a group of people who believe that some people are going to get it and some people are not going to get it. And they're lost in my view. They still so, don't have yeah. a clue. So Vince, <laughs> um, you... Um, when, when you were describing about this one year of search, demanding to know um, the inner part of, of your being, um, yes. and then you came to this point that you have this in, inner encounter, um, yes. thereafter, what happens? What happens to the face after? And how would you describe it? How would you say? I mean, um, to be honest with you, I mean... <laughs> I started going up to people, you know, I went to my, my father's wife at the time. And I said, you know, the first thing I thought, we're God. That's all I could say. I was like, we're God. And it was like, and it was so exciting. And, and I, I was very um, inexperienced at that time. I had that encounter, 
but I had no idea how to process that or to communicate that or what that was going to mean to people. If I started sharing that, <clears throat> it was so brand new to me. And I started to run into, well, all the different things that you would run into. People mm -hmm. have a lot of different reactions to that declaration. Mm -hmm. If I say we're God, um, mm -hmm. someone might say that's blasphemy. Like, you know, if they're a religious person, they're like, there's only one God and Jesus God, and you're not God, you're a sinner. Or if they're Christian, that's the thing that I would get a lot. And I yeah. was like, oh, okay. So I started to learn very quickly that people mm -hmm. don't have a clue and mm -hmm. um, that I'm alone for the most part inside of what I experienced. Mm -hmm. So I began to, um, that hurt, mm -hmm. uh, the, even though I had this experience, this direct encounter, and it was so profound, I still mm -hmm. felt my humanity. I still felt the pain of being uh, maybe what I perceived as rejection, mm -hmm. um, uh, not have, being able to share in the revelation mm -hmm. with others, feeling very mm -hmm. alone, even in the Christian church. When mm -hmm. I started to share with people my experience, I would get mm -hmm. lots of arguments or attacks mm -hmm. or threatening mm -hmm. you know, me about this, that, or the other, and throwing the Bible. I literally had guys throwing a Bible at me um, saying that that's not in the Bible and da da da. So I didn't know the Bible at the time. So it was frustrating. And then other religious people could accept it or spiritual people could, could, could accept the idea, but I felt like they also didn't really know. So there's a lot of mixture of like what was going on. I just, I became hungry to better understand my experience, articulate it. And then I started to realize words when it gets into a conversation, it's like, oh, this is not what I want. So I said, you know what? I want to know how to give people a direct encounter themselves. I yeah, don't want to so talk about yeah. it. So Vince, let's uh, go to the point whereby um, how does one apply um, some of these, uh, you know, because you're, you're in a coach, um, you know, there must be some techniques. Um, yes. And I thought that it'd be so uh, important for listeners and viewers who have spent the last um, 35 minutes with us or so to have some takeaways. Um, you've got your own experience uh, with a kind of life that it's not desirable, right? And then you've got a life that kind of brought you out of that. And then now we're talking about applications, um, helping people with maybe a couple of tips, because I know this is going to be long and, and I'm very sure that you would have a lot of therapies for people, but are you able to share like two tips uh, with the listeners and the viewers? Um, if people do struggle with idols or we call it bondages uh, with whatever, right? Um, bondages with cigarettes, um, in your case was cocaine, etc. cetera, uh, bondage with uh, vaping now, uh, bondage with, um, uh, I mean, just being addicted to the computer, being addicted to, you know, by surfing or something. Yeah, and these are the idols in our lives. Pornography. So, yeah. yeah, can you like give like two tips <clears throat> to the listeners for that takeaway? Yeah. So if I'm going to, you know, there's a, there's a framework I operate from and yeah. in <clears throat> to help people understand the work that I do, but I'll just say this. Yeah. I, there are effects and there are causes. Yeah. Addiction of any kind, yeah. whether it's pornography, whether it's vaping, yeah. whether it's drugs, whether it's workaholism, whether it's yeah. addicted to being right and making people yeah. wrong, whatever the manifestation is, that Ooh. is the effect. And I don't deal with the effects. I deal with the causes. And I, I think it's a, at the bottom of the effects that are causing damage or seem to be causing damage in the people's causes. lives, there is a core wound. Tell us. And the addictions, the, the behaviors, the whatever it's people have that's hurting life, it is the compensation. Mm. It, is the, it is the effort to compensate yeah. for something within that hurts very badly. Okay. It is sure. the effort to hide that wound okay. from their own view because they don't want to see it because it hurts so bad. Or it's they don't also even the effort. Or they don't right. even know it. Yeah. It's it's long buried. And they the only reason I know up. this is because I've I've had to dig up and be yeah. with my own. They were covered so, up. Yeah. Yeah. Which gave me a clear understanding and, and helped I me see. map the terrain of the human psyche okay. and emotional. So nature. one question, Vince, how effective it is. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> How effective I'm is trying it? Trying to get into the cause of it and then trying to unravel and undo the effect mm -hmm. of whatever bondages that's holding anyone back, um, the idols. So, yeah. how effective is that? Like you doing 
giving that tip to people to looking at their causes. It's radical. I like, mean, are you able to rattle off like two that, tips? How what what should I do like today? I'm gonna search my life. I've got lots of idols in my well, life. Well, <clears throat> what should yeah. I do? So. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, what I found is that this yeah. type of work requires the presence of another human being or group of human beings. Okay. Because the, the, su yep, the suppression that we have uh, been running for so many years yeah. has become so effective and so good that even with our best intention and effort, yeah. we simply cannot <clears throat> penetrate or access that, that area of the subconscious. Yeah. Um, there are many things that get in the way. And even yeah. someone like myself, who's highly trained and has done yeah. this for nearly 20 years, still gets yeah. support to yeah. keep working through things on my own. Okay. So I don't really, sure. I think you've got to have support yeah. to get Number the work one, done. <clears throat> okay. Support as in um, support from your friends or support from a specialized Not necessarily. People who um, are no. Talented. So I train, I train coaches and people, or the, if I work mm. with couples, I train all the people I work with mm. on how to provide the type of space that's required mm. for this type of work to yeah. happen and for the, yeah. the type of results that I produce to be produced. Yeah. There's a certain way of being with another human being mm. um, that's not evaluative. Yeah. It permits everything. If you mm. tell me that you wanna kill yourself, mm. then I say, I got that and I totally understand. Of mm. course you would. Most people will freak out when they hear that and they resist the communication. If someone says, mm. I just want to go out and get high, yeah. they resist that communication. They think they, they want to put in a control or a change effort. Mm. And what that, unfortunately, what that does is trying to suppress what's coming forth mm. just keeps the human being further stuck. So no matter what shows up in my space, I welcome. And I teach my clients how to welcome or invite into awareness, everything. If you feel like you want to kill your father because of what he did to your mother, mm -hmm. I take an interest in that. I say, tell me more. Where do you feel it in your body? Without a judgment. There's zero judgment. There's a lot of curiosity. Now, mm -hmm. that's one thing that people can begin to apply to themselves. At mm -hmm. some level, they can be curious Find about their feelings. Yeah. yeah, de shaming everything. De -shaming. And that's where I see religion making a huge mistake. Because religion oftentimes starts to, again, move back into even the Bible itself teaches that the law could not save anybody because the law only points out the sins or the shortcomings that people are living in. It was grace and truth that leads people into freedom. And so non-judgment. Okay, why well, one question before we say goodbye, and I love for you to continue this conversation on episode two. So it kind of like a teaser there um, for, for the listeners and the viewers. Vince, um, tell us how much of your therapy um, or your help, uh, self-help um, is based on biblical principles because you talked a lot about faith. Yeah, uh, great question. And maybe in another episode, I can actually give you a direct experience yeah. of the way that I work if you're interested and we can demo yeah, sure. what I do yeah. um well see this can go two ways right there are people who I could say that everything I do is biblically based yeah uh, but I've had Christians not recognize that mm. um I'm an avid student of the bible for nearly 20 years mm. and I'm pretty well versed Mm. I could get up and lead and teach a sermon or, mm. you know, share from any portion of the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. I love the Bible. I thoroughly mm. love it. Mm. I believe that everything that I do reflects mm. who Jesus is and was mm. and will forever be. Mm. And I don't believe Jesus is concerned about the ideas you accept or not accept. I think Jesus is concerned about leading people to a realization of what they actually are. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then he said things like, I in you and you in me and I in the Father. Like he talked about these things that pointed to whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. He identified himself with all humanity. See, Jesus is the true blueprint. I don't care if you're a serial killer, Jesus mm. is the man's real life. Mm. And that man's belief or unbelief does not invalidate the mm. fact that the truth is true about that man. Mm. So my operation, the biblical principle that I'm operating from is that everybody is Christ in a body. Mm. And I don't care what their behavior is. I don't care what happened to them. 
I don't approach anybody like some people are saved. Some people are going to go to heaven. Some people are going to hell. Everybody is the perfect image of God that I deal with. I don't care what's going on in their life. And because that is my foundation, I'm 100% effective with all my clients. Okay, I'd like to know um, a little bit about your training. Um, uh, if people will want to hear more from you, um, uh, could you give us in short um, the final uh, 15 seconds of our wonderful, valuable time that you've shared with us? Uh, tell us about your training um, in that professional sense. Like, you know, um, yeah, just tell us. Yeah. I think what you're pointing to is I have the Inner Coaching Academy. Okay. And the Inner Coaching Academy is a uh, year-long uh, coaching, li coach licensing and mentoring mm. program mm. that empowers coaches uh, inside of these distinctions and these principles mm. um, to do what we do. Plus, they have an opportunity to earn money with us to get paid uh, working wow. within our events mm. and to utilize these very highly effective tools. Um, for their own personal development and mm. as a coach. Uh, we also support them in building their business yeah. um, and how to get, you know, promoting and marketing successfully. So um, they're not just learning a modality or a methodology. They're actually yeah. learning how to operate a business as a coach so they can be successful financially. Sure. Um, great. Uh, and also doing good in the same, at the same time, right? I think it's doing yeah. the best work that we could do on the planet right now. Yeah, because, you know, this... Um, during this very stressful time for mankind, um, you know, we, we are really thrown into very strange times right now. You know, um, I'm sure in America it's opening up and uh, yesterday I think the CDC so. says even vaccinated people they've, they've got to put on mask again. Um, I think I think you've heard that. Um, I read it in yeah. the papers. But yes. I think a lot of people have a lot of mental situations already because of a prolonged situation that goes nowhere. Right, it's a, you're really like being blown left and right and left and then right again and then you don't know where you're going. So I think it's going into people's psyche. Uh, and I and uh, Singapore has seen the highest number of suicide last year. Uh, mm. I mean, Singapore has got a population of about six to seven million, and there was 451 direct suicide that you can wow. count on that these are suicides. And of course, mm. many more cases. Um, that you don't you don't identify or count them as suicides. I'm very sure yeah. they are, or even so, not reported uh, at all. Those that are already um, uh, uh, counted as suicide was 451, and mm. and that's incredible. Uh, you're talking about a small city, for example, a small city. I don't. I mean, Singapore is so, such such a small city, um, mm. and, and uh, we've got even a lot of violent cases coming up. You know, mm. brothers killing sisters within mm. the family. Um, beating up the sister until she kind of like died you know Pe people are just going off tangent so to speak yeah. so i think this is the time whereby um the inner work um or the inner savior um for mm. yourself um has to um be, i mean it is a time where people have to start looking at it um uh, whether people realize it or not. I mean, for example, you looking at me, okay, it looks like it looks like I'm good, but you never know after I switch off the, the Zoom, right? You never know. Uh, so I, I think this is a lot of uh, work for people like you. Um, and I'm glad, uh, and I'm so thankful to have found you and to Thank have you, you sharing um, the last 40, 40 minutes or so um, with us. It's a very wonderful time, and you have eloquently really identified um, these um, areas. And I mm. hope I could like kind of rewind and stop you, like um, slow down 50% uh, 50 of the way you speak. <laughs> but, you know, it's a lot, a lot of work that you've done. That's why I, I think um, I've got two X from you, two times from from you, even though I've got like 40 minutes of you, I think actually we've got 80 minutes of you because you spoke mm -hmm. twice the speed. Um, and I think with that, I, I really am so grateful. And I think you've got this uh, thing, um, uh, this subject matter that is so important, especially during these times of the pandemic. People are just swung left and right and left again, are losing jobs, losing mm -hmm. families, losing their minds uh, we're losing talking businesses, about losing you know when you lose yeah. your mind you lose everything you lose when you lose your mind you lose your whole life 
right? That's your inner core. Um, and, and that's why um, inner, the inner uh, training that you've got um, and the inner therapy that you do, I'm very, very sure um, uh, a lot of people uh, are waiting for that, uh, even though they may not know that. So I think that awareness that you create um, is so important, uh, Vince. Thank you so much. For the final um, five seconds or 10 seconds, would you like to say something to wrap I up? Just thank you. Thank you for creating this opportunity for me. Thank you for, I could sense your care for humanity. Mm. And I acknowledge that. I acknowledge your presence uh, here online for, for people, that you're committed to really bringing that which is going to serve people. So I honor you for that. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. I wish you great success in everything you're doing. And thank you so very much. No, I thank you, Vince. Um, and I thank you for your kindness, um, you know, for whatever you do. And I think the awareness starts um, here. You know, for a mm. lot of people who have not heard about these things. And, and, you know, just before we lock off and say goodbye and thanks to you, uh, you know, these topics are very taboo um, in a lot of societies, right? And not many people like to talk about their vulnerabilities. Not many people like to look into themselves because it's such, an ex it, it's such a society that we are in whereby we are so much affirmed, affirmed by external things the clothes you wear, the brands that you are able to afford, the cars you drive, the number in your bank account. You know, not, you know what I'm trying to say? You are affirmed by external things. And people do not want to look at internal things, things that are untangible, right? And things that are untangible in a society is always go, go, go and chase, chase, chase. Um, you kind of think that, okay, um, this can't take importance over the rest of the things that I can measure, like a report card of my life. Um, yeah. Success, for example, right? So I, I think um, the pandemic presents this, the, the opportunity for all of us to look into ourselves. Because in a lot of times, I mean, in Singapore, we are actually on a semi-lockdown now. We are. A mm -hmm. uh, semi-lockdown meaning that people are told to stay at home. Mm. Um, restaurants are shut um, mm. till um, I think uh, the end of August. Um, people are back again at home. Mm. So I'm thinking that the work has to start from the inside uh, because the external work has stopped. It doesn't matter how much number uh, you've got in the bank account now. And it doesn't matter what car you drive now in the pandemic, really. <laughs> as long as it is shut and it drives. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, this is the yeah. time where by the external things, that things that you can measure and things that is external that you actually affirm yourself and you affirm your self-ego and your meaning of visit existence from the outside world has kind of crashed. Yeah. If you know what I'm trying to say. And I think oh, yeah. people should go on to this journey about searching for the inner being and the inner... Uh, journey that you have gone on uh, and, and to start re-looking at all these and identify all these idols in their lives. So yeah. um, this is something that I've got uh, from, from you uh, yeah. in our conversation. Thank you so much. It's so deep um, and it's so uh, valued and so necessary. Yeah. And I would just like to add one last thing to what you shared there that the idols and all that, it's not, I, I don't make that wrong. I understand why people do what they do. People always behave according to how they perceive life themselves, the world, the situation they're in. Yeah. Uh, it always correlates. And I think what's important for people to get is that um, to not make themselves wrong, but to really mm. start to take a look at what they're attaching to mm. and really dig a little deeper and get support. Um, because most of all of that is really just driven by that sense of inadequacy and inferiority that they feel for very real reasons yes. I mean, different things growing up happen and we don't get a chance to process that we don't process it we don't get a chance to be heard or or heal some of those things that really hurt us growing up and it doesn't have to be as traumatic as me watching my mom get abused it could be much less um intense just but still be, very painful be just be acknowledged for your existence existence and also acknowledging yeah. the pain yeah. that one has went through acknowledging your own pain and being yeah. heard and seen and yeah. felt for that 
can bring a tremendous relief within. And that just helps people give up the addictions, mm. give up the idolatry, give up whatever is there because yeah. they you feel know, our, You know, I can talk to you, Vince, for hours and hours. Um, <laughs> we're so into this and I'm so into this also. And I think the conversation has to start, uh, yeah. especially in this part of the world, if you know what I'm trying to say. I mean, in a very, um, in the east part of the globe, we're talking about east part of the globe, people are really, really, um, number one, reserved. Mm. People are unwilling to open up to talk. People have this um, need of self-censorship. Um, so It's conditioned so, into the culture, really. Yeah, and, and I think, and that's why I, I would really invite you for the second episode so that the listeners in this part of the world can start really tuning in um, and then having this awareness that, hey, we have got to make that change and it has to start from the inside. That's great. You know, and like I said, I'd love to demo a process with you that everybody could participate in. We could oh, actually wow. I could run a process that whoever's listening could just follow the guidance wow. and instruction and I could get tremendous benefits from the inner coaching work that I share. Sure. Thank you so much, Vince, and all yeah, the protection and love and blessings from myself and Singapore to you and That's to beautiful. your family and to your loved ones, your colleagues and uh, your coaches, the people that you're coaching. If that's thank such a you. word, um, yeah, you know, thank you, Vince. 